In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and their Catholic faith. Sadly, many may never find their way back. I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe that God has called me to use my background in media to be a catalyst in the new evangelization. Our organization produces inspiring and creative evangelization messages that have helped lead hundreds of thousands of inactive Catholics, converts, agnostics, and atheists home to Jesus and His Holy Church. Join us as we travel across North America to bring you stories of heartbreak, redemption, and transformation as the Holy Spirit leads His people home. God has an extraordinary plan for each of our lives. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him and bring as many people with us as possible. This is Catholics Come Home. Now, I welcome you to my home to hear their amazing stories. Welcome to Catholics Come Home. In this episode, we'll meet a woman from Middle Tennessee who served as a social worker for 20 years before becoming an ordained female Episcopal priest and a hospice chaplain. While serving at Episcopal parishes in North Carolina, our guests began looking into the Catholic faith because of its unwavering stance on all the pivotal moral issues of our day. Soon, she accepted Jesus' call for her to convert and come home to Jesus' holy Catholic Church. Like everybody else in this series, today's guest came home to the church by responding to the call of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to meet Jane Brock. Jane, welcome to our home and welcome home to the Catholic Church. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here, Tom. Our viewers are in for a treat. I know your story, it's fascinating. But let's rewind a few years and go back to your childhood days. We wanna know where you grew up, what your family was like, and what it was like being a kid in those days. I grew up in Middle Tennessee, the only child, the late in life only child of yeah. my parents. I'm fourth generation Episcopalian as a oh. child on my mother's side um, that we know of. Yep. And uh, mom and dad were charter members of the little Episcopal church in our town. And, but I was the only child of my age in that Aww. church. It was very tiny. And so uh, growing up, I had a, a very normal childhood. Mom stayed at home, dad worked. What did your dad do for a living? He was the Sherwin-Williams paint store manager oh, neat. at home. Yes, he was a jeweler at first, and then when I came along, he went with Sherwin-Williams and worked for him uh, for 30 years. So you had a well-painted home all the yes, time. I, yes, we did. <laughs> yes, we did. Yes, we did. It was wonderful. And how about schooling and all? I, I went to public school. There was not really such thing as private school mm -hmm. back in the 60s, in the early 60s. And in Middle Tennessee. Yeah. And in Middle Tennessee. And in the bigger towns there were, but yeah. McMinnville was very small. Um, and so I went to public school and graduated from Warren County Senior High School in McMinnville, Tennessee, and then um, graduated um, from Tennessee Technological University oh. with a degree in biology and chemistry. Wow, that's impressive. But I didn't want to teach. I was young. I went straight through. Uh, 21 years old when I graduated from college. Were you going to be a and, doctor taking those? Yes, actually oh. I was going to be a doctor. And then I changed my mind. Oh. Uh, and decided that I didn't want to, to go through all that much more schooling. Oh. And so um, I ended up working for the state of Tennessee. Oh, what did you do for the state? I ended up working for Child Protective Services. Wow, what a calling. Um, it, was, it was quite a, an, an interesting 22 years. Wow, of, that's a long time. Working. Well, God bless you for helping kids and families in our society, but that's, that's a tough job, isn't it? it? It was, and for somebody who didn't really have the social work background, I found that I didn't have the theoretical base mm. to do the work when drugs became very, when cocaine oh, really wow. became prevalent. In, Never would have thought in, of that. Yeah. I know. And so I ended up going back to the University of Tennessee mm -hmm. and getting a master's in social work. Oh, wonderful. And that helped me. Um, but that was also a dodge to keep from doing what I felt called to do. Which was? to go to Episcopal Seminary. Wow. Well, I will tell you this. All three things you've done, Child Protective Services, Social Work, and entering the Episcopal Seminary, were all serving people. You always had a heart to help people, didn't you? And I had the um, biological, psychosocial, and finally the theological background. Yeah. To It was kind of a holistic approach to, to dealing with people, which was very helpful. So when you say you went to seminary, what did you do? 
Like, what did you become? I became an Episcopal priest. An Episcopal priest, a yeah. female Episcopal yes. priest. Yes. So for our audience, that's that's unique for us. We're not yes. used to that. Yes. What were you called by your congregation? Mother Jane. Mother Jane instead of Father Jane. Mother yes. Jane. That's... There, there was Father Whoever and Mother yeah. Jane. That's an so, interesting title. <laughs> yes. And uh, actually, the adults could just call me by my first name. Sure. I was never that stuck on a title. I don't think I ever would have been Catholic if that hadn't happened ah, first. We'll if, hold if, that thought because that's going to be interesting. I, I will, I will but do that. What can you share with your experience with that? When I was 16, they weren't even ordaining women yet mm -hmm. in the Episcopal Church. And I had a sense, I actually had a dream about Jesus calling me to something bigger. And because they didn't ordain women, I kind of said, oh, well, that's yeah. nice and kept on going. But it nagged at me mm. for almost 25 years. Wow. And so they began to ordain women um, rather illicitly at first in the Episcopal Church. Mm. And then the Episcopal Church embraced women's ordination. Um, and, but I do have to say that we never did believe in transubstantiation. Hmm. So that, that was um, less of a sticking point yeah. in the Protestant bodies, yeah. uh, which we can talk about more later on. But I ended up going to uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and entering seminary and, and enjoyed it. The community was wonderful. It was the first time and you I really... enjoyed the theological studies. Yes, that was right yes. Up your it was alley a conservative and... Episcopal mm -hmm. seminary. Okay, which was great. Lots of scripture translated, most of the New Testament from the Greek, and so got lots of Greek. Uh, learned Hebrew, but never used it very much, so don't have it much anymore. Um, but it was it was really wonderful. Uh, was ordained on time by the Bishop of Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and served a little while there. Then moved to Raleigh. North Carolina mm -hmm. and served a, a small congregation there, which we tripled in size in three years, in the three and a half years that I was there. We tripled in size, but it was this big to begin with, so, mm -hmm. so we didn't uh, have far to go to triple it. And then was called to Charlotte to a congregation as an associate pastor, and then began to realize that it was gonna be difficult to redeem the direction that the Episcopal Church was taking. Next, you'll hear what drew Jane deeper into the Catholic faith. Well, it, it, it's, it's my eternal life, and that means All everything. Our family has spanned the centuries and the globe. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We established orphanages and helped the poor. We are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing comfort to those in need. We educate more children than any other institution. We developed the scientific method and founded the college system. We defend the dignity of human life and uphold marriage. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are transformed by sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which have guided us for 2,000 years. We are the Catholic Church. With over one billion in our family, sharing in the sacraments and fullness of the Christian faith, Jesus started our church when he said to Peter, the first pope, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. So if you've been away from the Catholic Church, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. We are Catholic. Welcome home. So Jane, here you are, an Episcopal priest, a female Episcopal priest, and almost immediately you start having concerns with the theology that your church is going toward, all the pivotal moral issues of our day. What did you do with that and how did that wrestling in your heart start? It was always there. I was raised in a conservative household. Mm. Um, and so that, that was always how we, how we rolled in my family. And then to have uh, all that wonderful um, conservative teaching, uh, traditional, interpretation of scripture, exegesis, was really wonderful. But in, in somewhat of an arrogant bent, I guess, uh, I thought I could make a difference. I thought mm -hmm. I could help to change things. And what ended up happening was the Episcopal Church began to be more congregational. And we were mm. never a congregational church. Mm -hmm. It was always a hierarchical church with the bishops and the priests and the deacons. Yep. But then as people began to hive off, what I saw was what was happening in the Protestant bodies. Uh -huh. 
If you didn't agree with your bishop, you hived off, made a different congregation with your own beliefs. Church planting. It, well, they called it church planting, mm -hmm. but it really wasn't. It yeah. really wasn't. It was more of a just breaking a, a apart. breaking mm -hmm. apart. It's like when a rock hits a windshield. Yes. <laughs> and you get one little ding, and then, then it eventually spreads. it just spreads. Mm -hmm. And that's what I saw. And I couldn't live with that. It was a direct contradiction of John 17 that they all would be one. Amen. So I have to ask you, here you are, this is your vocation, this is your career, this is how you make a living. You had arrived to your goal. How, how did you deal with, what do I do with this and do I give it up? And how did Catholicism even get on the radar at this time? <laughs> Catholicism wasn't anywhere on the radar at this time. If I had said I would be Catholic, if anybody had told me I would be Catholic, I would have laughed. I began to cast around for what I might do, keeping in mind that this was my vocation, it was my community, it was my paycheck. And you had done so much education, so many mm -hmm. other careers, it's not like you were 20 years old and could just no. choose a career. No, I was, I was middle-aged and I decided I just couldn't do this anymore. The young man who was the thoroughfare at my ordination to the priesthood mm. converted. He became Catholic. He became a Catholic. The mentor priest who was responsible for me going to seminary converted. Wow. And I began to think, hmm. <laughs> but I wasn't ready yet. So did you have some interesting conversations with him? Yes. Were you going to prove him wrong? I, I was going to prove him wrong and, and argue him back into the Episcopal <laughs> Church. And he dared me to buy a catechism. Lent was coming. He said, buy a catechism and just read the parts you don't agree with. Right. You already know so much. I mean, the Episcopal Church and the Catholic Church have very similar liturgies. Yeah, there's some that, yeah, it's very, very close. Very, very similar, it, yeah. yes. And so he said, just read the parts that you're not familiar right. with, not comfortable with, Right, to see why with. we teach what yeah, we teach. Right? absolutely. And I thought, sure, fine, I'll do that. And <laughs> I did, and slowly began to see... Maybe this is the church that Jesus started. So you originally picked it up thinking you could convince him, and yes. then you realized that the catechism was convincing you. Yes. And then I read John 6 through Catholic eyes. Yeah. And actually, the Jesus present in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity, was the easy part for me. Right. And when you read John 6, you know, truly, truly, I say unto you, lest you eat my body, drink my blood. It says, and the, and the Jews left disgusted. They thought it was cannibal. They, yes. like, they couldn't handle it. And he didn't say, hey, come back. I just mean it symbolically. He didn't do that. No. So it was, it was grossing them out. They couldn't handle it. And, and it shows it was not a symbol. He meant it as his true body, blood, soul, and divinity. Yes. So I did a lot of crying and a lot of praying uh, and a lot of soul searching. Sleepless nights. Some. Yeah. The priest who was, uh, I had offered to go through RCIA, and because of my background, he said, no, actually, I want you on the RCIA team if you oh, come into the church. Wonderful. And so, but he kept saying to me, you have to be sure. You have to yeah. be sure. It's better not to come in than to come in and leave. Good for him. Be sure. Be sure. Yeah, because statistics show about 70% yes. of the people who go through RCA leave after a few yes. years. And it's not always because they weren't sure. Some maybe because they got married and thought it was convenient to convert for the spouse. That could be. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them just didn't take it seriously, thought it was just a, a, a brief, slight yeah. commitment. It's not a lifelong commitment. Yes. So God bless you for taking it seriously. Well, it, it, it's, it's my eternal life, and that and means all everything. Us. Yeah. So I ended up... The priest who was preparing me said, I want you to go to adoration. And I said, what? <laughs> I had no clue. So I went home and I looked it up right quick and I found our adoration chapel and I went. And I came in and I knelt down and I said, in my mind, if this is you, show me. And I could see his heart beating in the Eucharist. And awesome. I got out of there so fast, wow. it scared me. <laughs> I, I fled the scene. <laughs> but I went home and I thought about it. I talked to the two people who had been influential in my life uh, to, to convert in the first place to Catholicism. And they said, you got to get off the fence. Yeah. The fence belongs to Satan. So yeah. to not make a decision is to make a decision. Yeah, some say uh, the devil uses a good to keep you from doing the greatest good. Absolutely. And the enemy of God's best is the merely good. Sure. Mediocre. So, mm -hmm. so that's, I ended up calling the priest and saying, 
when are we going to do this? Awesome. Now, were you in Raleigh or were you in Charlotte? I was in Charlotte. You are in Charlotte at yes. this time? Yes, I was in Charlotte. I'm in Charlotte still. Yeah. I'm still in the parish where I was confirmed. And that parish is? St. Matthew. Well, I know that parish. I did a men's conference there, and it's yeah. the largest Catholic parish in the United States. Yes. It's got thousands and thousands of parishioners. 37,000. Pineville Matthews area of North Carolina, yes. below Charlotte. Yes. It's a wonderful, vibrant parish. Well, we thank God you're, you're in the Catholic Church, you're a practicing Catholic, and that you had enough love of the Lord to seek the truth and to give up a vocation, a career, a call, all that, to do what you knew God was calling you to do. When you do what He wants, He provides. All the time. He provided a job, He provided a house, He provided a community. I lost nothing and gained everything. You can't outgive God. You cannot. But it takes our faith, that's our response, right? To say, I trust Jesus, I trust in you. Exactly. I remember an Indian priest once in confession, I was talking about something, he says, oh, that's because your faith isn't strong enough. And I figured like, what a thing to say to me. And he was absolutely right. <laughs> you know, how, how Truth often, hurts. <laughs> yeah, how often we don't realize that we kind of slap Jesus in the face thinking, oh, he won't do that. He, God loves us. He loves yes. every one of us. And Jesus died on the cross individually for each one of us and collectively for all of us. And he knows how to come and get us. Yes, customized for each one of us. Absolutely. Yeah, he knew your way, he knew my way. Exactly. And he, uh, he planned it. And that heartbeat in the Eucharist was certainly a way yes. he, got, he got to your heart as well. Well, we praise God that you're Catholic and we praise God that you did the right thing and chose, um, chose to listen to that still small voice in your heart. How did the Holy Spirit kind of put the cherry on the top of that Sunday and uh, really solidify the deal where now you're in the Catholic faith and kind of, kind of lead you as the advocate, the paraclete, the guide, uh, who we need most during these times. Jesus said, I have to ascend to send mm -hmm. you the Holy Spirit. How did he start guiding you to, to your vocational calling within the Catholic Church? Well, number one, he provided a, a hospice chaplaincy for me, oh, which awesome. enabled me to um, continue my work. Helping people, helping theological. People, but yeah. but at, at a lay level. Yes. Uh, but I was able to baptize people. If I couldn't get a priest and somebody was dying, oh. I'd call and say, can you get down here? No, we can't make it. You do it. So yeah. I baptized people. So you were given people. the authority to do that. There are people that are Catholic who didn't know they were Catholic <laughs> <laughs> until they were baptized. I explained it all to them. Sure. And, uh, and so zoomed into heaven. I had a friend, Deacon Joe Lassard, God rest his soul, who was the first permanent deacon in the United States and a hospital chaplain, and his son's a chaplain mm -hmm. as well. And he said, it's one of the most humbling things you can do. Please tell us about serving as a chaplain. I worked with the dying and with the families of the dying. And I would always go in and assess where they were in their spiritual walk, how I could walk with them, if they needed to have their pastor come, if they were Catholic, did they want a priest? Yes. Uh, and I would make those arrangements. And uh, that was all in addition to the work I was doing in the church, teaching mm -hmm. Bible studies, being on the RCIA team, uh, being a Eucharistic minister, a lector sometimes. Wonderful. Um, so I've been so very what you do in your spare time. <laughs> <laughs> well, being single has its advantages. Yes. So yeah. I, can, I can give myself fully to what the Lord has but Jesus talked me. about that in Scripture. He says, yes. when you can, That's right. stay single. You have That's more right. time to serve me. St. Paul did you, that. Well, we, we thank God you're serving in that way. Thank you. It's wonderful to be home. In our final segment, you'll hear what's new in Jane's life and ministry work today. I wouldn't be anywhere else. I can't think of anything that would make me leave the Catholic Church. It is here where you'll find the best marriage counselor, greatest healer, wisest teacher, and closest friend. I need your grace. I need your favor. I need your mercy. Jane, God not only brought you into the Catholic Church, He used you even more. Hospital chaplaincy, extraordinary minister, Bible studies, all kinds of things at your vibrant parish of uh, St. Matthew's. What are the things that feed your faith so that you can keep on this journey and help feed other people's faith? That's very important to be able to pray the offices every day, 
I read through the Bible every year. I started that 30 something years ago. Good for you. And so I read through the, the Bible every year. Mm. Adoration, daily Eucharist, Bible study. Awesome. I either teach it or I, I'm in them. And so that, that really has, has been phenomenally helpful. How do you then feed others? And what do you think the greatest need people have today is? You know, you know what people need because you're serving them. What's kind of the common thread today? Everybody needs Jesus. Amen. Everybody needs Jesus. They just don't always know they it. They don't always know it. Mm -hmm. And they try to, everybody, every, we all try to fill those places in us that feel empty mm -hmm. with the things of the world. Yeah. And when we turn our lives over and fill them with the things of God, then suddenly we're satisfied in ways we had never even imagined. Beyond our wildest dreams, huh? Beyond. Yeah. It, it's just amazing how God can work given the permission. God will never beat down our doors and force us He's to do He's a gentleman. He, he wants, a yeah, he, gentleman. he gives us the opportunity to surrender. He calls us with a gentle voice, but he doesn't force us because it's free will. It's his gift of free will. He wants us to show our love by keeping the commandments and then turning to him and saying, okay, God, your will be done, not mine. Jane, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I think it's today's day and age. We're all kind of struggling uh, with issues of the church, issues of the world. What wisdom can you share with us to help us get through these troubled times? Everybody is put on this earth for a reason. Our lifetime job is to find out what that reason is and to live it out in fidelity, to live it out faithfully, to live it out with hope, and to bring the good news in whatever way. That doesn't mean you have to be an evangelist uh, in terms of Bible thumping on the street corner, but tell your story. How is God working in your life? What has God done for you? Nobody can argue with that. It's the truth. It's the truth. And so I always tell my classes this, look for what God has, is, how he's working in your life and go with him. You can't go wrong. You cannot go wrong. And each one of those, you said it so well, each one of those callings and testimonies is personal. You can't go wrong. I mean, God called me to use my advertising talents to mm -hmm. do this. And I said, you mean I can enjoy serving God? The <laughs> light bulb went off? Of course you can. And look, at he used all of your theological background, your background in, in you know, child protective services, social work, all, and put a big bow on that now. And now you're serving in his church that Jesus himself started, doing all the things that use all the talents God gave you from your background. I wouldn't be anywhere else. I can't think of anything that would make me leave the Catholic Church. Praise God. You know, as, as, uh, as goofy as some people can be, as goofy as some shepherds can be, it's the church Jesus started that feeds us with the Eucharist, forgives us in the confessional, guides us with the Holy Spirit to the end of time, and there is no second best. There <laughs> so, is no. The church is perfect. Yeah. It's populated with sinners. Amen. And, and we're among them, and I we need to pray am. for each other. Huh? Absolutely. Well, Jane, we uh, thank God he called you home, and we thank God you're serving in such a noble, wonderful way. And you had the humility to accept the call to say, I need to leave something that isn't right, and I need to trust God and come into the Catholic Church. Jane, welcome home. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Let's talk about the virtues. Practicing the virtues help us grow in holiness, renew our culture, and become the saints that God created us to be. This week, we'll focus on the virtue of generosity. Generosity is associated with the beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. To be generous is to be merciful, a spirit of giving of one's money or possessions for worthy charity. This virtue exemplifies the heart of a disciple. Mercy and generosity often go beyond reason. The greatest generosity is the generosity of God. He has generously given us life in His image and likeness, and has given us the gift of Himself in Christ's offering on the cross for our sins and in the Holy Eucharist. We should seek to emulate God's own self-giving generosity, recognizing that God is our wealth. Only in giving ourselves wholly to Him and to others do we find true blessedness, real mercy. Our culture can give the impression that greed makes us richer, but it is greed that impoverishes us, while generosity sets us free. When we are truly generous, we are close to the God who, in an act of supreme generosity, created us and redeemed us. 
So let's get practical. Here are three ways you can grow in generosity. First, give your time to help another. Time is one of our most valuable commodities. Perhaps a relative or friend who is ill could use a visit or a call, or maybe a ministry at church could use a few hours of your volunteering time. Second, be exceptionally generous with your almsgiving. God blesses us with wealth, not so that we may hoard it or needlessly spend it, but so that we may be good stewards of it. Are you being a good steward in your tithing? Third, be generous in your family. Is there someone in your family who needs you to be exceptionally generous with your love for them right now? Whom can you shower with a liberal dose of generous care by helping them with a project, chore, or just your undivided attention? Think of something you can do in generosity for a loved one this week. Let us pray with the words of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Teach us to give and not to count the cost. Here's your opportunity to grow in faith and help Jesus save souls. Visit our CatholicsComeHome.org website and click on the Shop tab. Here, you can discover our four brand new popular books to help you and those you love grow closer to Christ. The Willpower Advantage, Building Habits for Lasting Happiness, includes a personal spiritual audit and a customized plan to help you fight lifelong vices and find freedom in Christ. One Moment Can Change a Soul helps you guide family and friends home to the Catholic faith. Plus, two beautifully illustrated children's books to help your children or grandchildren stay close to Jesus. Epic, The Story of Jesus' Holy Catholic Church and Santa's Priority, Keeping Christ in Christmas. You can also order a car magnet to evangelize in traffic, evangelization cards, and DVDs with all of our best episodes of our international television series. If you have a question or want to tell us how Catholics Come Home has blessed someone you know, or you can financially help us blitz the secular airwaves with these powerful evangelicals, contact us at info at catholicscomehome.org or by mail. Catholics Come Home, P.O. Box 1802, Roswell, Georgia 30077. Please help Jesus save more souls. Mother Jane, as she was known, served as a female Episcopal priest and a hospital chaplain before her conversion to Catholicism. Now a faith-filled Catholic, Jane serves as the coordinator of bereavement services, leads a Bible study, and helps as an extraordinary Eucharistic minister at St. Matthew's, the largest Catholic parish in the United States. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Catholics Come Home. Please keep Jane in your prayers. Remember to fulfill your role in the new evangelization and help love somebody to heaven.